Hello everyone and welcome to the final part of my coverage of Unity of Command 2 Stalingrad DLC. And today in my guide you will see the entirety of the 6th and 7th conferences of that campaign. From Winter Givita to Yerevan and from walks in the park like 3rd Kharkov to the absolute terminal cases like Astrakhan. But first, since I've happily completed all of the DLC on hard, let me discuss a few of the general points and impressions that I had and let me first tell you that I'm really happy with the pacing of the DLC which isn't perfect in the Victory in the West original campaign but pretty much all of the DLCs including I'm happy to say Stalingrad have improved on that and Stalingrad shows a really nice mixture of easier and sometimes mind-bogglingly difficult missions and especially in the historic branch of the campaign you never get this permanent sense of everything increasingly going to hell, or vice versa, it's snowboarding so much that you don't need to consider any challenges at all. There is a really nice ebb and flow, and I'm actually really happy that all of the final missions in all three branches of the campaign are somewhat easier, offering the well-deserved relief in contrast to the missions that came before them. My impressions may be somewhat skewed because I've only played this DLC on hard, but I have found appropriately that the alternative history branch was considerably more difficult, and much of it is due to the fact that most of the losses that you sustain in these missions carry over forward without too many reinforcements, so definitely go for the alternative history branch if you're seeking more challenge, and especially if you're looking for the most difficult mission in this DLC and arguably in the entire game. Astrakhan will cause you to scratch your head so much you'll need a helmet, even with my advice. At the same time, I know that many people rush to alternative history and I urge you to go for historic branch because it has, in my opinion, very successfully implemented a new concept for this game which is completely defensive scenarios, i.e. the big disasters, disaster on the Volga and disaster on the on, you are not supposed to conquer any objectives, you need to hold stuff sometimes for a brief period of time, and undoubtedly these missions offer a really nice contrast to everything we've seen so far in the franchise, and I really look forward to future defensive scenarios or even defensive campaigns that the game could explore. Imagine doing a defensive Barbarossa campaign or that Steiner attack that never came. Even though as far as I've heard, these scenarios have been rather difficult for the developers to make. I think it is effort well spent because plus hell, those missions are just fun. And speaking of innovations in the DLC, let me also mention the fact that you have allies and more importantly their own HQ that persists throughout the missions. Even though I have found, and this is a piece of advice for you, that only the Romanian HQ needs serious upgrades, the DLC is somewhat stingy with the prestige and neither the Italians, nor especially the Hungarians, play a significant or decisive role in any of the missions, Romanians do. And while I'm sure that this is more about historic events and orders of battle than a game design failing, but it still sometimes feels like a missed opportunity. And finally, let me just tell you that I spent, what, 65 hours with this DLC? This is hard for you, obviously, I'm expecting 20 to 25 hours on normal or classic if you're going for all the objectives, but my point is that while you are progressing with a campaign, you are often returning to the same locations. I mean, sure, there are mountains and plains and snowy and traditional deserts, mountain passes, major and minor rivers, Soviet naval bombardment, naval and airborne landings, but you still keep returning to that Stalingrad area and go back to fighting in this odd village of Abganerovo. I mean, it's it's everywhere, uh, and you have to fight for it all the time, and the so scantra hack, and you fight back. And then I looked the village up. It is a real village, and I found its flag. 
And then everything became crystal clear. Two swords in the shape of an X and two heads of wheat. That's two X, two games, the developers of the game. And what is that triangle other than the representation of the Illuminati pyramid? And the swords protecting the symbol of the ancient god Cthulhu means that they're a secret organization protecting the god, which when it wakes up will cause a worldwide famine. And so every time you fight for Abganervo, you fuel an Illuminati AI developing bionic augmentations for their future agents and leaders as they tighten the measures of- And now, back to our regular programming with Doodles. Vintergewitter is another chapter in the Disaster on the Volga story. Except that in this one, we're supposed to do a little bit of attacking and not lose too many German troops. Which, as you may guess, is the most difficult objective of the whole mission. Despite the fact that finishing it 100% means losing quite a lot of your German troops. But first, let's look at the easy bits. Similarly to Disaster on the Volga, you Western objectives, i.e. objectives west of the Don, are very much about retreating. Retreat along the entirety of the front line and set up defensive outposts in Kantemirovka, Milerovo and Morozovsk. It's very clear and convenient, one HQ per town. And in Kantemirovka and Milerovo it should be pretty easy, just make sure you don't feed any of your German troops to the Soviets, use your Romanian and Italian troops as screens, and leave stronger entrenched divisions in Milerovo and Kansimirovka proper. I also recommend you to pay attention to the section of the railway between the towns. The Soviets actually have enough time to reach it, so blocking it with zones of control and having your tank division hovering in the area to help out if necessary is a good plan. Because your army group Don doesn't have any Romanians or Italians in it, you need to be even more defensive in the Morozovsk sector, and I recommend you not to leave any German troops in the Hexes north north and northwest of the town, that area will be flooded with Soviet troops and you are very likely to lose your divisions there. So provide entrenchment and AT guns in Morozovsk itself and these two hexes between the rivers east of it. And obviously move all of your really weak divisions far into the rear so that no Soviet troops actually reach them because they will be pretty much useless in this battle and if caught will screw with your loss count objective. Finally, it's a good idea to blow up the bridges north of Tsimyansk and northwest of Tatsinska. Actually keep a couple of divisions between Milerov and Tatsinska because the Soviets will launch armored raids to try and take that airfield or maybe cut your supply lines and a light screen here should be enough. And now let's look at the tough bit around Abganerovo again. This village is nothing but trouble. And I have very bad news for you. If you don't block the supply of the units around the shooter own link up objective, you're probably gonna fail in the east. And so your initial task here will be to launch a potentially extremely suicidal attack to the east to block that supply. So concentrate artillery in the southeastern parts of the Stalingrad pockets, breach the Soviet defensive line and send your motorized divisions in. That Soviet level 2 supply hub is fed through an intersection in a road, so take that hex and if you can and you you should kick that infantry division guarding the supply hub out and take that supply hub. The effect of this is that the enemy will lose two trucks for a few turns and your troops in the south of the pockets will get some supplies. In the south, kick out those rear guard divisions, try to destroy them but make sure you touch Shutovo by the end of the turn. During their own turn, the Soviet troops in this area will try to push east to kill all of those motorized divisions breaking out of the pockets. They are very likely to all die, but they will have served the purpose of blocking the supply of all of these mobile troops around Shutovo and Abganerovo. And on your turn one, in addition to taking Shutovo, send at least some of those tanks to the east to prevent any link up between those mobile formations and the supply hub in that extreme east of the map to make sure that on their turn two, they can't attack anymore. If you can take that supply hub, it's even better. And once you succeed, 
speed with all of this, it'll pretty much turn into a mop-up operation, destroying all of these out-of-supply Soviet troops, taking enemy supply hubs that pop up later, they will, and ultimately taking the link-up objective. It is a good idea to block the railway bridge just west of it, and maybe kill a few Soviet divisions between Kalach and Link Up to make sure that Link Up is safe, the Soviets are not going to counterattack it. And finally, that little bridgehead you've got north and northeast of Link Up is very dangerous. The Red Army loves attacking there, so make sure you don't leave any weak troops there, don't leave any troops in the plain. Hex is there, hold that forest, but nothing else. And thankfully, throughout the rest of the pocket, defense is not going to be a, as much of a concern as supply is going to be. Oh no, not another disaster. Disaster on the Don is the younger and smaller and easier sibling of the bigger, nastier and badder disaster on the Volga. And like it, it's a purely defensive mission where, interestingly, we need to hold the objectives for a certain time. However, just like in Vintergewitter, we are supposed to preserve our troops, this time Hungarians, and that's the most difficult objective in this relatively easy mission. The first thing you need to understand here is that the Soviets will break through and steamroll over you throughout most of this map, especially around Drososh, Ostrogorsk, and Kastornaya. So don't even think about setting up any permanent defenses and do your utmost not to involve the Hungarians in any fighting. Those 15 steps will run out very quickly. So my approach on turn one here was to leave a strong German division in Rossosh and retreat him with all of the rest of your troops located south of Ostrogorsk in the direction of Novioskol. You will lose the division you left in Rossosh, but anything other than a decent sized German division sitting in that town will be broken by the Soviets by the end of turn two. As you can see, they've got a lot of tanks in this area and this will become the main pivot for their attack. So your goal in this sector will be to protect the Novioskol Hex and the railway bridge south of it, even though it's not as important. Use whatever troops that manage to retreat to Novioskol to set up a barrier just east of it. Use those forests to prevent the AI from breaching north towards Tarioskol and to slow the enemy down until you get your reinforcements that will be strong enough to protect Novioskol permanently. Equipping those defending divisions with 80 steps is an obvious and very good idea, and as you retreat, push all of your Hungarian troops onto the other side of the river. Their safety is critical, those tanks included. In the center, i.e. in the sector between Voronezh and Ostrogorsk, I recommend you to destroy that Soviet bridgehead on turn one. It's not gonna be easy and I suggest you to do a few restarts of the mission to get a good roll on your air support attacks. But once you succeed, you will effectively block any kind of Soviet advance in that area for as long as you need, and with a decent, well-entrenched defensive line along the river in Ostrogorsk, you will be able to hold out there until all of the rest of the front collapses, and then retreat in an orderly fashion, and muster at the other side of the river, next to Stariuskol, with your remaining German divisions in the area functioning as screens, and here it is, this is your strategy for moving the Hungarian troops out of the area. Finally, the Castor and Voronezh sector are going to be somewhat easier. The Soviets here really don't have the momentum to take Castor and by turn 3, and they'll mostly be stuck fighting your well-fortified divisions. It's actually a good idea to send that Panzer 38 tank division, and maybe that Hungarian tank division as well, to Kastorna to deal with any Soviet breakthroughs there, because the combat isn't going to be as intense as in the south, with much less of a chance of severe tank losses. And your main goal here will be to hold Kastorna until the end of turn 3, obviously, but also maintaining the connection between the 2nd Army HQ and Voronezh, so that it can provide emergency supply to that salient. The enemy is rather passive around Voronezh, but if your divisions there start running out of supply, they will take the chance and will take the objective. So for as long as you hold Kastornaya, 
keep feeding these guys via normal supply or through emergency supply from the second army HQ and then start retreating you will have to let Voronezh be encircled just make sure that both the fortified divisions there remain in place and well supplied if the enemy takes the hex next to Voronezh conquering the city will be much easier for the AI and it's gonna go for it send a couple of your infantry divisions to guard the to Kursk objective the Soviets will rush it but you'll get some tanks as reinforcements there so it's not gonna be a problem while all of the rest of your German infantry that remains after Kastornia stops being an objective should fall back to Stariaskol gazing the retreating Hungarian divisions and ultimately just in case occupying and protecting Stariaskol as well There's no point being subtle about what third Kharkov is. It's this huge delicious biscuit that's been waiting for you for this entire campaign. Oh, so you've survived all of that, you've played Threat and Vice and Disaster and Volga and everything. Here's a biscuit. It's very much like the good old times we actually had overwhelmingly strong units and could kick everybody's butt. Moreover, this being the last mission of the campaign, just go ahead and spend all of your prestige decking out your troops. Obviously focusing on your first and fourth armies, since these are gonna do most of the work and as you may guess, all of that area south of the Zoom and Kharkov will be taking both of these tanks. On turn one, take Slavansk, it's a good idea to give set piece attack to the first army and deal as much damage to the Soviet tanks in the area as you can. And on turns two to four, rush north and northwest, block that bridge northeast of Slavansk and send a couple of units one of them needs to be a well-equipped infantry to a zoom this is a prime location for using one of your flying artilleries and the town yields you a truck card which is a nice bonus in this somewhat supply deprived area and the fourth army is a bit more scattered and given that you need to destroy that tank core and you really need to destroy it it'll probably have to hang around the Pavlograd near area for a couple more turns so obviously deal as much damage as you can but make sure you don't lose your supply lines don't let the AI take Dnipr it's gonna be a disaster this is actually another good place to use one of your flying artilleries because the AI loves to use the forest north of Pavlograd as a hiding place for its tanks and other units and clearing up that railway is key to your success in the north and once this whole area is secure push the fourth tank army north as well. Now let's look at the situation with the second army and the camp formation. The Soviets seem to be said to be pretty aggressive here, but the problem for them is that they don't have enough forces to comfortably advance, so your first turns in these two areas should be spent maintaining the front, especially in the camp area. Pick off whatever Soviet divisions you can with your motorized divisions, and then retreat to maintain a sort of a zone of control barrier in the area. In Sumi, first thing you should do is replace that Jäger division in Sumi with a proper German division and then feel free to use your tanks both Hungarian and German to pick off some of those divisions and as your first and fourth army units advance from the south and actually get close to this whole northern area, look for openings in the Soviet front near Sumi and try to squeeze your tanks through. You can actually get behind Soviet formations in this area and block their supply. By the beginning of turn 4, your tank spearhead pushing from the south should more or less reach Kharkov and this is where you'll hit something that feels like a wall. The Red Army is very likely to consolidate a significant force around the city and those patches of forest around it actually aren't helping either. And so at this point, oversupply your tanks and send them to destroy as many enemy infantry units that are sitting out in the plain hexes as you can and then move your infantry especially from the camp group in to maintain some sort of a front and to prepare for the assault of the city. Since Kharkov is surrounded by plain hexes it's not that difficult to actually cut its supply off and then just pepper it with faint attacks from your tanks as they push towards Belgorod. In my playthrough I also built bridges southeast of Factory District and crossed the river to block the supply line to Izum because I waited 
wasted both of my flying artilleries on nonsense and the zoom was still in enemy hands. Even though the Soviet division guarding the bridge is pretty powerful, you can breach through and block the supply to that town. As you clear the Kharkov area, make sure that the Soviet units in the pocket west of it don't break out and are properly destroyed. And taking Belgorod, unlike Moscow 41 and Belgorod, is just gonna be a repeat of the Kharkov story, block its supply, pepper it with faint attacks and take it. The third Basil of Rostov is an alternative to third Kharkov and and while it isn't very difficult and offers a lot of fun 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 tank fighting, it can be annoying at times and doesn't offer as smooth a ride as third Kharkov does. So let's first look at the more fun western parts of the mission where you're provided with plenty of powerful mechanized and tank divisions and your immediate goal unavoidably is taking Rostov of and re-establishing the railway connection between Taganrog, Ploritarsk and ultimately Stalingrad. Try to deal a lot of damage to the enemy tanks around Rostov on turn 1 but also push towards Tatinska. It is actually possible to block the railway line between Kamensk and Tatinska and use that suicide Luftwaffe division north of Kamensk to block the other railway, feeding it. Also, forget about that salient north of Rashilovgrad. Retreat all of these troops back to the other bank of the river. Feel free to blow up any bridges north of Rashilovgrad and redirect all of those mobile units towards Tatinska. And you should spend your second turn clearing the railway, connecting Rostov to Tatinska, setting up a supply hub next to the airfield and clearing the hexes around Tatinska. In scale. This task will probably bleed into the third and fourth turns. Because there is a huge flat area north of Tatinska and the Soviets have a lot of tanks there, the AI's actual reaction might vary depending on how well you do around Rostov and Shakhty. And in my successful playthrough of this mission, actually the Soviets consolidated quite a lot of tanks around the Tatinska area by the time I more or less reached it. So the best thing you can do there is crossing the first river at that conflicts of rivers next to Tatinska so that the enemy doesn't block you in there. And by the time Tatinska falls, your infantry should already arrive from the west and its main task should be to continue advancing towards Morozovsk while most of your tanks will push north and pretty much have this huge tank battle. Your goal here will be to pretty much destroy most of the enemy tanks and prevent the AI from causing you too many nasty surprises, set up a big supply hub next to Tatsinska and then split your armored mechanized forces between Boguchar and Serafimovich slash Kletska. Tatsinska provides you with a Luftlotte card and Morozovsk with a flying artillery card which will make your life taking these objectives much easier, while the infantry that took Morozovsk will advance northeast and help blocking the supply lines around Kala and take Kletska and Serafimovich. And now let's look at everything that happens south and east of the Don. As you can see, the stretch of railway between Kotelnikovo and Proletarsk is kind of barren, and this area will cause you the most headache that there is to have in this mission. Set up a mobile defense, use your tanks and motorized divisions to destroy enemy troops, or at least exert zones of control to prevent the Soviets from taking any of the railway hexes, it's critical that you don't let the Southern Front mobile troops take any parts of the railway. It is pretty much a mission-ending event. However, in addition to just defending and counterattacking, there are three things that you can do to make your life easier. One, blow up the road bridges between Semikarakorsk and Zimovniki. This will discourage the AI from pushing from the north, which it might, and it might allow you to free up those divisions guarding the bridges and then press gang them into helping with the railway. Another point, the tank divisions next to Katelnikovo are very likely to be pretty powerful, and it's not impossible to breach through and take both of the supply hubs feeding the troops of the Southern Front. This will stop the Soviet advances much sooner and make it easier for you to move those troops to somewhere more important. Finally, north of Kotelnikovo, you can breach northwards and take that supply hub very 
than to give it a style. This will block the supply for pretty much all of the troops around Abganerovo and eliminate any kind of threat the Soviets can exert to your Stalingrad pockets in that area and ultimately help you restore the railway connection to Stalingrad and refocus your attention towards Kalach, which is a very good place to use your flying artillery in. You are not very likely to hold more than a couple of hexes around Kalach by the time you need to take it and flying artillery will solve that problem obviously. Also in my successful playthrough, I've seen the AI actually moving troops from the Nizhnyachir and Simyansk bridges to use these divisions as protection against my tanks advancing in the north, so you can actually use this opportunity to send your tanks across those bridges and help with Serafimovich Kletska and maybe even Morozovsk. Christmas cheer, hearty ha, is one of the missions that we don't see too many of in this DLC. Christmas cheer is a one trick mission and it's sitting there right in the middle of the map. The pontoon bridge west of Surovikino, and I know it's very expensive to get the Romanians the ability to build bridges, but it's not the last mission for this HQ and they are going to do most of the work in this mission. So in general brush strokes, in addition to building that pontoon bridge, and being very proud of it. On turn one, you should obviously breach onto the other side of the river, so that by the end of turn two, you block Sorovikino and the Nizhny Chir area from the railway bridge to the east of them and the northern supply hubs. And you should also launch a tiny attack south of Nizhny Chir to control that bridge as well. This is the reason why I gave that Romanian infantry unit an artillery step. Once you complete both of the maneuvers, the entire Sorovikino Nizhny Chir area is gonna run out of supply very quickly. You may comfortably wait for turn 6 around Nizhny Chir without attacking and just collecting all those prisoners. The AI is a bit zealous about the section of the railway line between Surovikino and the railway bridge east of it, so if you can, try not sending one of your tank divisions to actually block that bridge. There is a reasonable chance of it dying, even though the Soviet mobile troops, the tanks, aren't too powerful and for a good reason. But once you fend off those attacks, three of your objectives will be as good as done, and you'll only have to worry about Serafimovich and Kletska and your supply situation, potentially. That enemy supply hub in Surovikino is a very good way to resupply your hungry and out-of-fuel divisions. And it's also a good idea, once the defenders of the railway bridge west of Surovikino go completely weak and suppressed to start clearing that railway and moving your supply hub into the eastern area closer to Serofimovich and Kletska. Also, an important note on the Hungarian troops. While the tank division is not too bad and you should actively use it uh, to deal with the objectives in the east of the map, the Hungarian infantry is pretty much useless in the attacks. And since you're not seeing these troops or their HQ ever again in this DLC, feel free to use them for distractions. The AI is very zealous about holding that little salient west of Serafimovich. If you use one Hungarian division to cross to the other side, the AI will send an insane amount of troops to deal with that incursion, meaning that you'll have to deal with much less resistance elsewhere and probably more holes in that salient. Try to push your Hungarian infantry along the river towards Serafimovich. Certainly no combat because they'll just die, but the AI is very likely to leave a lot of openings for you there. And once you secure your southern objectives, immediately push towards Serafimovich, clear the railway line and take those two objectives. Serafimovich actually gives you an air support card, so feel free to use it, it's not necessary but might make your life easier. It's actually a good idea to focus most of your air support during the early turns on the tanks, the Soviets have a very limited supply of them and luckily they tend to stick to open spaces. Alright, here we are, Astrakhan, the most difficult mission of the DLC, and arguably the most difficult mission of the entire game. And I got extremely lucky by playing this game on hard and starting this mission with an extremely beat-up force that could do hardly anything of use against this insane horde of 
tanks and mechanized cores. I actually looked at the single scenario version of this mission, and the trips you get are very reasonable. On top of that, I didn't have too much prestige, and some of my HQs lacked critical abilities like my first Panzer Army did not have oversupply in this incredibly supply-dependent mission. So I had to do a bit of safe scumming to speed up my trial and error process, and I used all of the cards I had, which was one truck card, one air support card, and one flying artillery card. I usually reserve this privilege to the last mission in a campaign, but in this case, this is the penultimate one, the hardest in the game, and Yerevan, which comes after this isn't too difficult actually. Moreover, in addition to the flying artillery you get at Frolova, you kind of need two uses of flying artillery, namely an Abganerovo and an Astrakhan, because these two objectives put you on a very tight deadline. In any case, if you are as strapped for resources and weak as I was at the beginning of this mission, make sure that both the first and the sixth armies have at least one strong tank division with experience, six or seven steps, and good, strong specialist steps. All right, now let's look at what to do, and we'll start with the easier eastern parts of this mission. The main goal of the 17th Army will be to clear the railway up to Astrakhan, and ultimately actually to do an assault crossing across that major river near Astrakhan, and take that objective. So it's actually a good idea not to lose the cavalry divisions that the 17th Army has. They count as infantry and are compatible with assault crossing and are much more likely to reach Astrakhan in time. Otherwise, the 17th Army should be busy surrounding the two Soviet barriers along that railway, blocking their supply and then mopping up the out-of-supply troops, and then proceeding forward so it's actually a good idea to block the supply for the first barrier on turn two. With the second barrier, it's very likely that the first army will block the railway, but your 17th Army HQ and its divisions should be there to be able to mop up all of those out-of-supply Soviets, and then ultimately clear the railway, rush the cavalry to Astrakhan and do the assault crossing, which is the ultimate goal of all of this. All right, now let's look at the slightly scarier parts of the first tank army and the eighth Italian army. Reserve three fast divisions of the first army to deal with Abganerva. We'll talk about it a bit later. And the rest of the troops, including the Italians, will push east towards that town with a level two supply hub. That town is actually the easternmost hex where the supply from Alista can reach you. So it is a good place for your HQs in addition to that supply hub actually feeding a bunch of enemy troops in that area. So try to reach and encircle it as quickly as possible. It should be on turn two. The Soviet troops in the desert areas north and south of it are relatively passive and will be more interested in causing damage to you rather than blocking your supply lines. So as soon as they start running out of supply, don't get bogged down in fighting them and push your tanks east towards Astrakhan. However, just past that midway town, I recommend you to be very careful. As you can see, the Soviets have impressively powerful mechanized divisions in this area, and they will get activated around turn 3 or 4, and you really don't want them ganging up on your first army's best divisions, which they can and absolutely will happily do, so please feed them Italians. So send those Italian divisions on wild goose chases to the east. This is actually a very good time to block the Soviet railway line near Astrakhan, and obviously scatter the Soviet tanks and lead them into areas that don't have any supply. Maybe get some suppression killing your Italian divisions. In other words, getting prepared for a good shredding one by one. Once they separate and start losing their supply, they stop being this cohesive force that is really dangerous to you and will fall apart reasonably quickly. From there on, you should push towards Astrakhan proper. On turn 7, those cavalry divisions must touch the Astrakhan hex. Make sure that the railway is clear for good supply. And on turn 8, run a flying artillery and then maybe air supports and rush those assault crossings and take the city. Now on to Abganerovo, which will require you to be a little tricky. As you can see, you can't really breach the Soviet defensive line around Katelnikova. They have a crazy amount of tanks in the zone, and a bit of unconventional thinking will be required here. So the plan here will be to push
push three of your motorized mechanized divisions to the north, just east of Malia Derbeti, so that on second turn, you use these divisions to block the bridges between Abganervo and Stalingrad. This will actually cause supply problems to the entire Katelnik of Abganervo and Malia Derbeti area. On turn three, and this is where you probably will have to use your air supply theater asset, flying artillery, the Abganervo objective, and then push those divisions into it. There is a bit of a problem in this plan, however, because the AI will see your maneuver and will scramble all of its tanks in the area to Abganervo. And if you have to do any kind of combat outside of Abganervo on turn three, you're not gonna take it. So this is where the tricky part comes in, and it is a spoiling attack around Katelnikovo. You really don't need that entire salient, that railway is not necessary, and you're not gonna see any of these divisions anymore, so just breach the enemy defensive line east of Katelnikovo and send as many of your troops into that breakthrough as you can. This will distract a lot of Soviet tank divisions from Afghanerovo, allowing you to take it. By the way, it gives you a Tiger Specialist Step, which will certainly come in handy around Astrakhan. From there on, the divisions that took Afghanerovo, pushing north and causing general trouble to block enemy supply around Kalach and Ilovia, try to intercept whatever supply halves the enemy places just to keep those divisions supplied, you can actually route most of the enemy western defensive line this way without even having to fire a shot. Alright, and now let's go for the most annoying part of this mission, which is the northern breakthrough to reach Dubovka. So somewhat unexpectedly, the breakthrough happens between Serafimovich and Kletska. The main reason being that you have plenty of troops there and you can give your infantry enough artillery to do proper suppressive fire and then cross the river. Use your your air support to soften up for Lovo and send your paratroopers in there. And finally, use your precision bombing theater asset to destroy the bridge just west of Frova. While the Soviet divisions guarding the riverbank are relatively passive, the unfortified troops north and west of Frova will do everything to kick your butt, and blocking those two bridges will prevent them doing so. On your subsequent turns, flood in your troops, connect with Frolovo, try to clear the area of any unfortified enemies. You'll probably be able to destroy the enemy barrier at Kremenskaya and repair the bridge there, and send some of the Romanians in, just make sure you keep defending the bridges along the major river and defending your bank of the smaller river northeast of Serafimovich. I've seen Soviet tanks trying to cross that river if the bank is undefended. Pass Frolovo, push along the railway and set up pontoon bridges north of Ilovlia and then push your best oversupplied motorized and mechanized units towards Dubovka. The town itself isn't going to be too difficult, I've never seen seen the AI bringing very powerful units there, but keeping your flanks tight will be a bit of a problem. The Soviets will try and harass you, attacking mostly from the north, so it's actually a good idea to set up a couple of infantry divisions with AT steps in the hexes east of Frolovo, and then bring a couple of faster units like the Romanian cavalry or your Jäger divisions into the area between Ilovia and Dubovka to form a loose defensive line there as well. Once Dubovka is yours, build pontoon bridges, preferably in more than one place. Make sure your 6th Army HQ advances along with the troops. The supply situation here will be very difficult and you'll probably have to resort to taking enemy supply hubs for your own provision. But once you're prepared to cross the Volga, do it. It's a good idea to have five decent divisions around Dubovka once you do it. The Soviets will probably have a decent amount of troops on the other bank and you will need troops to either destroy them or take their zones of control, because in my experience, the surrounded Stalingrad objective itself is not going to be too difficult to take. The tricky bit is actually getting there. Good luck.
Alright, so now that we're winning the war against the Soviet Union, we're gonna fight the Brits. Yerevan is a nice little change of pace from Astrakhan, and it is a relatively easy mission. Even though it is going to be a bit of a mess in terms of supply, let's start with the easier part, which is the eastern section of the map with Yerevan. And the biggest mistake you could actually make here is overcommit. Send three or four strong infantry divisions, you will get get reinforcements in this area, and your best approach towards Yerevan will be through the road east of Karaklis. You should actually set up your main supply hub for the area there, although you'll probably have to push north of the town as well and wait for your reinforcements and then dash to Yerevan. At some point in the mission you will get a flying artillery, and this is a reasonable place to use it. Also look at the hexes east of Yerevan and Lenina Khan, if you take those hexes, you will start getting supply from Turkey, which would have been handy had it been necessary to go past Yerevan, but really isn't. The British are gonna get reasonably strong reinforcements in that area, so get the bloody town and forget that this area of the map exists. Now let's look to the west, and you may have noticed that most of the troops around Kirovabad belong to the 4th army and not the 11th, and it is a hint. Push straight to the south to take Stepanakert. As you can see, it's not well defended. And once you take that Soviet supply hub around Agyabadze, the Soviet troops between Mingachevir and Shirvan will start running out of supply. And I urge you to keep an eye on this because this Soviet-held area actually separates your western railway source of supply to Gori from the east of the map. And later you will actually need that supply to comfortably take Tabri as the troops that took Estepanakert will continue pushing forward to the south towards Ahar, which is actually where a British division counterattacked me. It shouldn't be too big of a deal, but keep that in mind. And ultimately, these divisions, in my case, it was the mechanized division and two mountaineer divisions, all of these people should reach Tabriz very likely way before the deadline. And it's a reasonable idea to wait a little for the supply to come for the fourth army. Army HQ to approach because this is the last remaining kind of difficult objective, as both Ardabil and Persian border will kind of just require you to show up. So speaking of, let's talk about the very east of the map, and your immediate task there will be to achieve a turn one breakthrough at Shirvan. The enemy defensive line there is pretty much static, so you can actually guess in behind it and not worry about too much about your flanks. So get those tanks and most rise divisions pushing forward towards Parsabad, Use your infantry to breach the immediate zones of control. Parsabad itself, as you can see once again, is not well defended. You'll just steamroll it if necessary. Use the guys that took Estepanakert as support, though in most cases you're probably not going to need it. And then your eastern division should pivot south towards that Soviet supply hub. It's very conveniently placed there for you to get it as soon as your motorized units are going to start kind of feeling very hungry. Use your air supply as necessary, you're provided with plenty, and then push towards Ardabil. Once again, this is not going to be a difficult objective. If you need to take a few losses, take them, because this is the end of the mission, the end of the campaign, you're not seeing these people again. Take Ardabil, it gives you a Luftplot a card, and then turn your sights towards Persian border. And here's a bit of good news, it's not going to be defended. If you have two mobile units in the Ardabil area, you'll just push one across the mountains to breach the enemy zone of control south of Lankaran, and the other one will just run in and take the Persian border objective. Blasting through that Soviet defensive line isn't really necessary. Finally, once the supply and HQ situation at Tabriz gets better, which should more or less coincide with your taking the Persian border, just push your mountain near elites into Tabriz and take it. Congratulations, this is the end of the campaign.
And this is it for today and for this DLC. I've profoundly enjoyed myself playing it, even though playing on hard has brought its share of frustrations. But that's my own fault, and I'm looking forward to all of the new content that Unity of Command 2 will offer in the future. I keep praising these campaigns, but the developers are really getting better at this, and every new DLC brings something special, something that we've never seen before in this game. So thanks for sticking with me so far. Subscribe, like, and comment, and well I guess until next time. Majestic. Majestic.